that's a really good question. And it's one that can only be speculated about. Uh, the political scientist in me would answer it by, by a sense of the Harper government seeing the War of 1812 as a means to differentiate itself from the United States. Uh, if you go back, for example, to the 2004 election, when all expectations were that Harper and the Conservatives would win that election lead up to it, and the Martin government was able to reverse the trend in the polls at the last minute and then be reelected with a minority government. The, way, the means, at least I saw in that election, that the Liberals used, the Martin strategists used, was to try to paint the Harper as Bush Republicans. They were too close to the Americans. Uh, they would be puppets of the Americans, satellite of the Americans. And I think this had a deep impact on the Harper strategists, on the Prime Minister, who, s who potentially saw that there was a need to constantly portray uh, his government, this government, as one that was not going to be beholden to Washington, was going to keep Washington at arm's length. And we've seen it, for example, in the Arctic, which Art Andrew can talk more about. So I think there was a, a political calculus, and although I'm always sensitive to the idea that governments actually think this way. I always, I always tell my students, governments aren't that smart. Uh, so I, I'm leery about it. I think it was, it was an opportunity, given the, the conservatives' agenda in terms of the importance they attach to modernizing and re-equipping the Canadian forces, to emphasize Canadian independence. Everything about the War of 1812 fit a Canadian story that needed to be told, I think, but not told very well. I mean, if I think if I asked everyone here, what do you know in terms of the Canadian government's efforts in celebrating the War of 1812, most of you would say very little. It never got anywhere. Uh, whether the government's learned from this uh, is an interesting question. And we'll see, I think, in the, in the next several years uh, what the government will do in terms of the major events which are about to occur. Uh, next year is the 100th anniversary of the Second Battle of Ypres in the First World War. Uh, the first time the First Canadian Division was deployed in combat in World War I. The Canadian troops played a vital role in the first major gas attack of the war to hold the line as other British and French troops collapsed in many ways played a significant part in stabilizing that line. The results, if they hadn't, could have been disastrous for the Allied forces. What will the Canadian government do? I don't think they're going to do a lot about that. Vimy Ridge, 1917, you go back to Pierre Burton's book on Vimy Ridge, Canada was, a nation, as a nation, was founded on Vimy Ridge where individuals from Quebec, from across the country, all melded together in the Canadian Corps to win a battle and seize Vimy Ridge, which the British and the French had attempted several times before and failed. It's a wonderful cel celebratory event if you follow the Pierre Burton line, and I'm not necessarily convinced of it. What will the government do about that? I, 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 at the end of the day, I don't think the government is very good at marketing it because they're Canadians. And we're just not very good at this. Uh, you can imagine in the United States, it's completely different. When 1917 hits, not, pardon me, 1918 hits, which is the year that the American forces entered the First World War, I can pretty well guarantee there will be major cultural events, probably a film or two, documentaries about the crucial role the American forces played in the Argonne Forest at Belly Wood and other places in the Western Front. We won't do it. We just, it's just, there'll be an attempt, but we won't be followed through because it, I don't think it resonates with Canadians. Uh, and I don't know why that's not the case. I mean, you, you might suggest, and I'll, I'll end here, I, th I hope I've answered your question. It might be the case that we just don't think that way. Uh, we're a very, I mean, I don't want to talk about Canadian stereotypes, we're very passive, quiet. Uh, we don't celebrate a lot of things in Canada. Uh, 
Uh, and it, I think this is reflected in the way we think about these other major events that have occurred in terms of Kennedy and the Armed Forces. Take 1942, two years ago, was the 50th anniversary of Dieppe, the first major deployment of Canadian forces in World War II. It was a disaster. It was a military disaster. Okay, half the, most of the Canadians were either killed or wound, wounded or captured. We did nothing about it. Maybe we should have done something about that because it was a big event. Uh, we are now in, in terms of Canada, we are now at the 100th anniversary of the Canadian forces in the Italian campaign. What, do you, what does anyone know about Canadian forces in Italy? In the Battle of the Liri Valley at Ordona? I mean, these were major, major com conflicts, battles in terms of World War II, which the Canadian forces in very difficult terrain and in very difficult conditions performed extremely well. We know nothing about them. Most, most in the Canadian public don't, and maybe that's a good thing. Because of course, if you celebrate the military, if you celebrate it too much, you get yourself on a, another slippery slope, which maybe we don't want to go down. So I hope that sort of answers your question. I would just add um, one thing that the military, or sorry, Harper has done to commemorate the War of 1812 is all military have to wear a little 1812 badge. The problem is our closest ally is the U.S. And of course, the NORAD relationship is really important. So when, when, when we go down to Colorado Springs, there's always this sort of guffaw about the 1812. And worse, when it was first um, given, it was it only had one pin. So it would spin around. <laughs> so the big, the big change now is that it has two pins. I don't know what the cost was for that. But it's not only the military that wear that, but our cadets wear them as well. So these little 12 year olds are running around with 1812 badges, have absolutely no idea what this is. And I think following in line with, with what Jim says is we're, we're good at sometimes seizing on the symbolism, but not thinking through the consequences and doing something um, either remarkable or noteworthy. I don't know if anybody saw the Tower of London, if you Google Tower of London and the poppies that are there, uh, an artist created by hand 888,000 some odd poppies, ceramic poppies, and they're spilling out of the Tower of London and then all along the floor of the Tower of London, it looks like a sea of red and it symbolizes all of the Commonwealth and UK soldiers killed in World War I. And it's just red as far as the eye can see. What they've now done is they've sold off every single one of those poppies for 25 pounds, and that money is going to go to veterans' charities. Canada's had arguably nine, nine years to come up with something. <laughs> and I, I, I don't see anything significant where we could have had opportunities, especially with the number of vets that we have now, the number that are suffering, um, we, we, we're good at seizing on the symbolism, but not thinking through what it is we could really do to make a difference. I know that in the Netherlands, every school child is assigned one of the graves, and it's their responsibility to go on a regular basis and check up on it, make sure it's clean, make sure there's no graffiti on it. And that's a tangible way to make sure that generations remember the sacrifice of war and they understand that. But we don't have that yet in our school curriculum. I understand it's coming and it's changing. Kids are starting to talk about war and the impacts, but you know, certainly for my generation growing up, you know, it was like something out of faulty towers. You just don't mention the war. Um, it's not something you do. So. about. I've heard uh, a few things on CBC Radio and my understanding is it's, it's also a protest to, to think about the wider implications of war and I know there have been even some vets who will wear the red poppy and the white poppy. Um, I'm, not, I'm, really, I'm not sure who started the campaign uh, and I'm not sure, um, you know, my first inclination was to think of well, white is usually the color of thinking of the white feathers that they used to give people in World War I for being coward for not participating. I don't think that's the thrust of this, but I, I really, I don't 
I, I don't know where it stems from. Um, it re represents the white piece. Yeah. White um, piece. And so that's what I'm wondering. Well, maybe Canadians don't need to wear on our shoulders like the Americans do the war mentality. Maybe we're celebrating peace, not war. Maybe that's what it's about. It may very well. It may very well. I, I think in many ways it does reflect a strong thread or element in Canadian society, in large part, as I mentioned earlier, because we do not see ourselves, in contrast to the United States and others, as a country made by war. Uh, if you think back, and some of you may be old enough to think back to the 1980s, the early 80s, where in Winnipeg, across the major countries, there were large-scale disarmament movements. Peace protests were, regular, were a regular phenomenon back then. Uh, but again, we sort of followed what was going on elsewhere in the Western world. Uh, it speaks to, I, as I said, I think a dominant trend. And, and I'll honestly tell you that when the white, this white poppy idea, I knew nothing about it until Andrea mentioned to me earlier today it came up. And I had no idea that it existed, and I had no sense because it hasn't really been something in the press or anything that I would pick up. Uh, I think, it, though, it's consistent with the idea what I would call that the Canadian forces, the use of Canadian forces uh, overseas by Canadian gov governments is largely supported because we march off to peace. Uh, that we go to help others who need assistance, where, as I said earlier, there's not a sense that, that we are in it for self-interest. I mean, what do we gain from this? We expend lives, we expend national wealth, so I think in many ways, it's a, it's a, it's, it differentiates us from the United States, which is always a phenomenon in Canadian society, the need to differentiate. But it also, I think, it reflects a supportive view of what the forces really do overseas. So I don't see it, in, in my view, little I've thought about this, I don't see it in conflict with red poppies, recognized as sacrifice, that it, they fit nicely together. Right. It's celebrating peace, not war. So it's the reverse of what people are saying. But that's maybe why, you know, uh, that's exactly what we're about. We might be passive, but peace is like what Gandhi did, you know, and a peace in that kind of a sense of a philosophy that we have, that we're not war mongers. Right. Yeah. Oh, and I think the, the other element is to remember, and I think this is pretty most evident in the peacekeeping days, which are long past because of the changing nature of the international environment. Uh, we've always understood the role of the Canadian forces beyond, different from the Americans and others in great powers that they're used to fight and advance our interests. We've always understood them in broader terms as providing aid, health, a variety. If you think back to Afghanistan, in fact, the majority of the Canadian forces in Afghanistan weren't in combat missions. They were in missions related to good governance, of health, of support to the evolution of civil power and authority and democracy in Afghanistan. Whether that's worked out or well or not it remains to be seen, of course. And we've always had a much more broader view of the role of forces. Uh, I've always liked to say there's an attitude, there's a general attitude of Canadian society. The Canadian forces, in fact, overseas are part soldiers and part social workers. And it's true, because we that's what we do. That's what they do. Well, we were watching a documentary in the Navy SEALs the other night, and that's one of the things the Navy SEALs were saying. They had to adapt a lot because of all the mistakes that they made. They had to integrate themselves with the other forces. And the other thing that they had to learn is how to drink tea with the villagers. Yep. You're dead now, right. Now they're more successful. It, it's been that. That path has much, been much more difficult for the United States uh, and their armed forces because of their history and their culture adapting to it than it has been for Canada. It's been more difficult for Britain because of their historical legacy, traditions, and military cultures than it has been for Canada. Uh, interesting enough, one of the countries that's arguably closest to us in this area has been Germany. 
they have evolved particularly away from thinking armed force in military terms, in part because of the historical legacy. And they have been much more in terms of the role of armed force in civil society and civil roles and health and those types of roles. So I, I think therein lies the key. If you want the Canadians to be more supportive of our military, then what I think we should be doing is marketing more of what you just said that the military does do from a perspective that's more tea drinkers with the population and supporting the population in ways that make sense rather than guns and weapons and killing each other. But they do that too. And I think, I think one of the problems that, that I have, and, and this speaks to the power of the Prime Minister, um, and why American presidents are so jealous of the power of the President, uh, the Prime Minister, he, because it's been a he so far, has the power to send our troops wherever he wants, whenever he wants. And unlike the President doesn't have to go back to the equivalent of Parliament to ask permission to spend money, because after 30 days, the president can't spend any more money on the war, he actually has to go and get permission. One of the things I see with our Canadian Parliament is we're no longer asking the tough questions. And if we're going to have this thing called civilian oversight of the military, it's really important that all members of Parliament, especially the opposition, ask those really, really tough questions of what is it we're asking our troops to do, do they have the resources to do this, um, what is the, the end date of this mission? How are we going to know if we've done it successfully? And one of the things is it's, it, it, people are reticent to criticize the military in any way, shape, or form, which means it also means that tough debates about why and when we're sending our military forces here, there, and everywhere, what is going to be the end result? Right now, for instance, it's We've got military members in Kuwait fighting in Iraq. We haven't gone to Syria yet. Um, I doubt there's going to be a helpful, healthy, open debate about what's going to come next. It's simply going to get rolled over for another six months. And we saw this too with Afghanistan, that you know the emphasis was on the PRTs, and any sort of discussions about the combat part that went on, which it did, um, it tended not to be not to be debated for fear of looking like we're not supporting our troops, and I think that's somewhere where Parliament has to to be more mature um, because it's not it's not responsible to send troops off on a wing and a prayer and hope that we can keep doing this by ad hocery. <laughs>